Good morning and welcome to our UBC Learning Circle, Becoming the Imperfect Friend, Squamish Contemplative Pathways to Healing and Reconciliation in Higher Education with Denise Finley. Today's conversation is presented in partnership with the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. We'd like to thank the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the Learning Circle and allowing us to have these conversations. Before we formally begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Please feel free to introduce yourselves and the nation you're calling in from in the chat box. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Serene Squawkin. I'm the Learning Circle Manager. I am Seal Coconogan on my mother's side and Hickory Apache and Belgian on my father's side. I will, encourage, uh, I will be your moderator for today's discussion and joining you uh, today, working behind the scenes is Cynthia, our production coordinator, and our program assistant, Kira. They will be in the background interacting with everyone in the chat. Finally, before we get into today's discussion, I'll provide a gentle heads up that the topics may be covered, may be emotional, uh, sensitive or emotionally triggering. Please make sure that you're looking after yourself, and if at any point in time you feel like you need to talk to an elder, friend, counselor, or fa family member, don't hesitate to do so. We have some prompts in the chat for you if you need additional support. Now I'll turn it over to De Denise to introduce herself. Hatsqual, Denise Quinsna, Tana Chinkla, Homolchison, Hokameos, Homish Chen. Good day to you all. My name is Denise Finley. Uh, I belong, proudly belong to the Squamish Nation. And today I am speaking to you from my village of Homolchison. Um, just overlooking the beautiful North Shore Mountains. And um, just to my, just so you get a sense of, of where I am situated uh, on this beautiful land, to my west, not very far, I could walk there in one minute, is the beautiful uh, Capilano River. And then, of course, we have the Burrard Inlet to the south and the North Shore Mountains to my north here. So thank you for having me today. Um, I'm looking forward to visiting with everybody. Thank you, Denise. Um, yeah, so uh, I would love to hear more about um, becoming an imperfect friend. Um, I know you your paper on um, contemplative, I keep wanting to say compalliative, sorry, contemplative pathways to healing and reconciliation in higher education. Um, I know um, we kind of talked about it in our initial call, but I would love to hear more about it from your perspective. Yeah, you know what? I have to just say, Serene, that I trip over the word contemplative all the time, and it took me so long to master saying that word. Um, and, and I use that word because I am a contemplative educator, which really means I'm interested in wisdom traditions and how wisdom traditions have always supported um, raising our level of consciousness and i and i do believe that we're living in a in a time now um with all of the planetary crises that we're seeing um and social crises and political crises that we're seeing uh that that we need to turn inward in and start to develop um not only increase our individual level of conscious awareness of our impact on each other in the world but collectively that shift needs to happen um and that fits quite beautifully with, uh, you know, some of our uh, Skohomish uh, philosophy and teachings and the article Becoming the Imperfect Friend. I think I said this to you when we first started talking. When I first started writing, I was invited to submit a journal uh, submission to write an article for, for the, a journal um, called the Holistic uh, Education Review. And uh, I actually, when I first started writing it, like with all my writing, I wasn't sure what I was writing about. I just put, you know, started uh, work, typing on my keyboard and um, as part of my methodology. And what uh, flowed out was this article that's now uh, being quite well circulated called um, Becoming the Imperfect Friend. And the article was written based on some of my experiences as a graduate student uh, at Simon Fraser University and as a consultant doing some, some work uh, with the Center for uh, Educational Excellence there and, and what I learned uh, through those processes. So yeah, it's been, it's been really uh, interesting. And since I wrote the article, I've had 
uh, more time to really think about the things that I've written and, and to reflect on um, just how, how needed these understandings are, I think, especially in higher education, but in the world in general, and even within our own communities where there's still, you know, for lack of a better word, a lot of conflict amongst people as a mm -hmm. result of, of, you know, intergenerational trauma and the impacts, ongoing impacts of colonization. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's very prevalent in our communities. Like, um, I think it's kind of a challenge to navigate because we're trying to be our authentic selves, but sometimes it can be hard um, because of the lateral violence that's present in our communities. And um, I know there's a lot of um, people still trying to, or doing their best to learn um, their culture or language or um, trying to find where they uh, are situated in their community and it can be challenging. And I know like just hearing what you have to say about um, your writing and when I, I feel like it's a great place to, to start, you know, I feel like sometimes we just have to take um, take that first step and just go. Um, and I feel like, um, a lot of our ancestors are kind of that way, you know, like, oh, like if you don't get it, like you'll get it in the next few steps or so, or, or um, like we were talking before, um, we opened the call, we were talking about how language, um, a lot of our teachers are just say to practice and do it. Right. And, uh, it's okay to make a mistake or to mess up, but, um, it's the fact that you're trying, right. Yeah, well, it's, language is such an interesting topic, because as I was saying before we started today, that I am endeavoring to learn my language and recognizing that in order to really know the worldview uh, as a Squamish person, one needs to uh, be able to speak the language. Um, and as I learn to speak the language, I start to see myself in the world and interact with the world in, in, in a very different way. So it's, it's a really powerful process of learning. Um, and it's not easy. And it's actually, it fits with the conversation about being the, becoming the imperfect friend, because it is a process of undoing and unlearning all of the conditioning um, that we receive through educational systems, right from even, I think, you know, daycare, preschool, kindergarten, elementary, all the way up through high school, and then into post-secondary education and higher education, this conditioning um, that is really in, intended uh, to assimilate us into a capitalist system that has to do with being competent, with knowing things, um, having an edge, being competitive, with other people winning and succeeding. And actually um, when we have to show up with all the answers and knowing everything all the time, there's not a lot of room for learning anything. And there's not a lot of room for the kind of vulnerability necessary uh, for any kind of transformation to happen. And it actually interferes with our ability to have the kind of meaningful, fulfilling relationships that can nourish our spirits. You know, that's our natural state is to be, we are naturally um, empathic, social, collaborative beings when the conditions support that. But we really do live in a world where it can be very dog eat dog. And that's trickled into our communities. Um, and we all understand the history behind that. Uh, but I do feel like talking about these kinds of things and raising awareness around them can help uh, give people things to think about in terms of, ah, like how, how do I maybe show up that way in my relationships with this? Um, I, I guess the, the perfect stranger, actually, it, that came from Susan Dion, who's an Indigenous scholar, and she her entire scholarship was, was around um, educating 
um, teachers uh, who were having to teach Indigenous curriculum and experiencing sort of this resistance or what she calls a will, like a willful, willful ignorance on the part of the educators where they would say, well, that's not mine to teach or I don't have anything to do with that. I'm, I'm not personally implicated in that history um, and I don't really have relationships with Indigenous people and so therefore um, I can't teach this or I have no right to teach this. And um, that's how she describes the perfect stranger. And so my idea for the imperfect friend was based off Dion's thinking around being a perfect stranger. And I thought, well, I, I see this as well. And I see this even within my own community where there's, there's this distance there. Um, and knowing what I know just about our psychology and the way trauma affects us and how fear can creep in, um, it can really close us off to learning new things from each other. And I and I I don't necessarily think that that's a willful act, although it can be on the part of some people. I think it's more of a protective instinct to say like, I don't want to go there for fear that I might I might be exposed, or maybe I will appear incompetent, or maybe maybe I won't do it right. Somehow I might get hurt, either physically, emotionally, or psychologically. And so I'm going to maintain a distance. And um, to me, becoming is that process of unlearning and rendering ourselves vulnerable to one another, because we can't learn anything unless we're vulnerable. But we also have to feel a certain level of safety to expose ourselves to one another again. And I just see that as a condition of our, our world and our capitalist regime. I don't, I don't think that that's just happening in our communities. I, that is very normalized way of moving through the world these days. Definitely. Yeah. There's so many things that come to mind when you uh, kind of talk about um, this struggle with perfectionism um, in the uh, Western colonial world. And um, what thing, like what comes to my mind is like just the characteristics of white supremacy and um, how the written word or um, <clears throat> trying to be polite all the time or, or like um, just uh, how that really comes to mind for me, like when you're talking about um, navigating um, this colonial um, and capitalistic way of living and how that really is detrimental to not only um, us as Indigenous folks, but uh, people in general, um, because it's unrealistic and how it um, makes us uh, kind of almost like a robot, like we were like we're trying to navigate this world in like this perfect algorithm um, now that we see that with social media and whatnot and how everything is um, kind of um, maintained for, for life, you know, like whatever you put on the internet is there for life, right? And it's, it's hard because you don't want to be mistaken as someone who doesn't know anything, but then um, like you were saying, um, it's cu curiosity and vulnerability are the way we learn best and um and it's that's how we navigate the world right like it's it's not going to be um you're not going to be a master at something right away like it, it takes it takes practice and it takes um stepping into and leaning into that um uh imperfect friend um which kind of kind of leads into my next question um we kind of um so you you were talking about imperfect friend um, and you were also talking about perfect stranger. Um, how would you like, just from, um, I know just reading from your article, you talk about the ways of um, stepping away from being the perfect stranger and moving towards an imperfect friend. How would you like, what are some th ways that you've kind of started moving towards being an imperfect friend? Yeah, well, it's been, I think a lifelong journey for me. Um, that I think I'm finally sort of getting a handle on now that I'm like in my mid mid life here uh, around really, I think allowing myself to be seen for who I am. And that really means that what's going on on the inside is matching 
what's happening on the outside. And so how I carry myself and, and what I say and what I reveal about myself is, is a closer match to how I really feel inside and being true to who, you know, really true to who I am and not striving. Um, and can I just say um, what Coutard talks about as the politics of recognition and not striving for accolades or striving for popularity or striving for that external material success that keeps us on this treadmill um, of trying to win all the time. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it takes us out of relationship. I, I think it, it causes a huge amount of social alienation I think that people feel lonely anxious and depressed for a reason because we're caught up in this sort of race if you will um and in the process neglecting you know neglecting what matters the most which is our relationships to each other our relationship to the land our mother earth that is the source of all life we belong to this land um but we're very much caught up in the material world. So for me, the biggest act of trust and vulnerability is to reveal and allow people to see us as messy, imperfect beings. And mm -hmm. I think education really, um, you know, educators, especially at every level of the educational system um, can inspire students towards um being true to their own selves mm -hmm. uh, and following their own, you know, unique pathway, whatever, whatever that is by modeling that, you know, for, so, so that they're not setting up an expectation of performance, if you mm -hmm. will. And I think part of the part of perfect stranger, um, I definitely, my read on that has to do with this, how we reward performance in our culture. The best performance wins and um but we are messy human beings are messy and especially where there's been uh intergenerational trauma we get very provoked by relationship by closeness by any perceived threat and healing is messy and so for me it's my favorite places and spaces and i think i love teaching because when i can when i'm in a space where I'm, where I'm teaching or facilitating, I get to show people what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the world really craves it. There, people are craving this right now. They're tired. People are burnt out. Definitely. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people are craving that authenticity with vulnerability and um, the realness that you're, you're speaking about and how, um, like, how we're not wanting that perfection uh perfectionism or um perfect life or nuclear family or whatnot like we want the messiness like it's just it it makes more sense to our brain you know like it's because we can relate to it it's more um relational and it's it's just more achievable like it's not like it's not going to be black and white it's going to have so much color and gray and um so much more vibrance than just what we see in society and I think it's that's what people crave right like um we see that with music we see that with art we see that with nature you know like nature is like one of our um, greatest teachers and I, I know you kind of touched on that a bit about how our indigenous ways of knowing um a lot of our teachings come from the land and a lot of our um, oral history comes comes from the land and whether that be the landscape or um just the animals that come from it but like yeah like that's that's so true like I I I I feel like that's that's so like enlightening I think that's this is the conversation that we're wanting uh we're craving right now is um how to navigate that and yeah um well, and I think sorry go ahead I was just oh, I mean, no I was just gonna say if, I don't know if you have anything else to add uh to what I just said well, yeah, I think we can really lean into what Gregory Cayetti calls native science. And he's an, he's an indigenous uh, scholar from uh, New Mexico. And so he, he, they still use the terminology of native there, but 
Um, and Leroy Little Bear, who's one of our very own um, scholars here in Canada from the University of Lethbridge, who I've, I've had the pleasure of connecting with personally before, but talking about how Indigenous science has to do with the mystery, the flux, the uncertainty, the, the indeterminacy really of the universe. And that's scientifically sort of proven that we live in a in a in constant flux. Um, but when when we apply sort of that, I, I guess what we would call the dominant capitalist um, hegemonic really way of viewing the world, we, we sort of try to make everything static and fixed. And when we make things static and fixed, they become dead. We become dead. And so mm -hmm. when we strive for um, this sort of performative static fixed persona, this is who Denise is. Um, and I have to show up all the time on in that way, then I become dead, my spirit becomes dead. Because we change every day, we are evolving and growing each and every day that we're walking on the planet. Um, and we're learning, you know, we're learning each and every day, and we never stop learning until the day we die. So I feel like inviting the messiness and inviting the the imperfection. And um, I think I chose that terminology of friendship because it felt safe to me. It's like, oh, like what a beautiful invitation to be an imperfect friend, to become an imperfect friend. Mm -hmm. um, I think really, really is what is needed. And I think our little people, our young people, um, little kids need educators who are able to achieve this as well in, yeah. in the way they teach little ones. Yeah. 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 I feel like even just hearing um, you kind of talk more about it, like it's, it's, it's so true to see that like our, our young ones, even though we kind of are caught up in this way of disciplining, I don't know if it's just the way that um, we were taught through residential schools or um, or whatnot um, about how to make your kid kind of um, ha like uh, uh, obey like that's the word that comes to mind for me is like obey you like they they have um, this level of and it kind of takes away their agency and it takes away their like um, autonomy as a, a young like a, a a young human, right? Like they, they have, they bring so much teachings. And I think, um, I think we know it as indigenous uh, folks, um, that, um, the reason why we're gifted our children or even, um, the youth in our communities is to exercise their, their voice to make us think outside the box and, and grow and adapt, like, like what you were saying and, and, um, force us to learn in a new way. Like, we weren't all ready for Zoom like in 2019, but as soon as 2020 happened, we we were all we're all on it like now, and it's it's just a part of life, right? And we grow and change, and I, that's the one thing I I always kind of um, say is that Indigenous folks are the most adaptable people. Like we ha we had to grow and adapt. We had to, um, and we know that we we want to we don't want to be stagnant we don't want to be complacent we want to to learn and we want to engage in challenging conversations because we know that that's what life's about and that's where we we can thrive um and be better people like even though we are faced with a lot of um challenges and adversities we know that we can still navigate it because we have this level of knowing who we are even in this mess you know and that's kind of what I got from your um your article is like um even though you there's a lot of healing and and whatnot but there's still a lot of like knowing who you are and like having those true values and whatnot and I think it's um sitting with yourself and with self-reflection and and um navigating the the mess and what, what do you like do you think that I'm on the right track or do you think uh it's kind of that's just what I've received from the article yeah I know I loved all the things you said there's a few things I want to want to uh, respond to that I heard you say and the first thing a little ways back was just this idea of how we discipline our children um in all the reading I've done and and in all the conversations I've I've had with with Indigenous families and people from my own community and in in scholarship and in researching and writing, Indigenous peoples have never used what we 
would call coercive parenting techniques. Mm -hmm. um, and yet uh, we live in a society where the dominant sort of, uh, I guess, um, trend around parenting and education has to do with coercion of mm -hmm. young people. So coercion for the purposes of assimilating them into an economic system so that they can serve that system. Um, and I think that when we do that, we dumb our kids down. I, I think we we um, rob their dignity sometimes. Um, and we don't demonstrate that very thing that you were saying has to do with our capacity to adapt um, that is innate in all of us, that we will, just like nature, we will grow and adapt to our circumstances. Uh, you, you do not have to tell an assemblage, an assemblage of um, like plants to grow together and work together. Plants will adapt and find a way to do that. And young people are very much the same in the right conditions where they're nur nurtured and they're nourished. Um, I've heard so many beautiful stories uh, where um, parents, elders, grandparents, community members observe children and through that close, close observation and care, know what a child needs at a given time. And then, you know, sends them maybe off to a particular person to learn something at that stage. But it's, it's not about deficit thinking and corporal punishment and discipline that is very much rooted in what we call behaviorism. And it's, it's very much, um, I think a, a tene of colonialism, if, if you will, that, that whole conditioning, uh, method of conditioning. So, so there's that. And then, um, the third thing, what, what was the last part of the question or the statement you made about imperfect friend or before you asked me, am I on the right track? I've lost it now. Yeah, yeah. I think I was saying, um, wonder, I'm trying to recall. I talked about um, children. I talked about adapting, and I think I said, um, "I can't think of it right now." <laughs> I think it's gone. Like, I, I think it was just like maybe just being like one of the most adaptive people, and like, um, and um, ah, I remember what I wanted to say. Oh, okay, cool. So there is a very brilliant um, neuropsychologist who at one time was like an English literary scholar. His name is uh, Ian McGilchrist, but he's written a really massive book called The Master and His Emissary. And I've read the book because I'm uh, doing a, a PhD in philosophy of educational theory and practice. And I, I found the book fascinating. I, it, it, it's a it's it can be a bit esoteric and hard to read at times but one of the things that i really loved is how he talks about how, the way that the two hemispheres of the brain work um and he actually says in the book that research tells us that indigenous people um have more brain symmetry than others and the reason for this is because we've developed the part and and we have i think uh land-based practices that keep us or suspend experience, direct experiences, participatory learning with each other, experiential learning, the doing of something, and not so much the thinking about the thinking about the thinking, which is more about the left brain organization. So we need both hemispheres, of course, they interact together to create our reality. Um, but there is, um, there is a need more and more, and I think uh, today more than ever for us to be having experiences that keep us in that place of like direct experience where we can feel inspired, awestruck, a sense of wonder. It's a more emotional, more emotional place. Like if you hear a, if, if you're with a group and a song is played and it brings everyone to tears, you know, it's this aspect of the brain that um, allows us to learn and grow and discover new possibilities. 
uh, to adapt to things, to our environment, to our circumstances. Whereas in um, the dominant paradigm, educational paradigm, it has more to do with using like the compartmentalizing sort of sense making. It's like a calculator part of the brain that says, oh, how am I going to use this experience to um you know, how do I put it into the frames of what I already know? So not a lot of change happens there. And, and so I think that's pretty fascinating to me that um, there's greater brain symmetry because we have practices that that exercise those, those aspects of us that really need now, now more than ever need to be exercised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that there's so much to add to that. And I just want to circle back one of the uh, um, our participants kind of Elaine, she kind of circled us back and, and she said that uh, I mentioned the healing and knowing where you come from and the self reflection and na navigating those, um, those themes and whatnot. And, and I think you kind of spoke to that, like with what you just shared and how, um, how it's kind of utilizing both sides of the brains and, um, and um, kind of trusting yourself, right? Like, I think we lose a lot of our trust in ourselves and that intuition um, when we are forced to do something, um, systematically, like, instead of being a bit more, um, chaotic with it, you know, um, I had a few people kind of just want to, uh, give us like a high level overview of the article. I know we kind of touched on, uh, some deeper points on the article, but, uh, I don't know if you want to just give like a, 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 just an overview of the article just to catch some people up. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, have a look at it if you haven't had a chance, read it, because I can't capture it all this way, but we'll look at, we have a film, a short film we want to show you that sort of the, the article was based upon um, what was captured in the film that we made and some work we did at Simon Fraser University, but it really is unpacking um, this idea of the perfect stranger and how this way of being is uh, is very normalized in the dominant paradigm and the capitalist paradigm, this distanced, distant, objective, um, strange, in a, a strange way of uh, being that's been adopted, where we're all sort of walking around alienated as strangers, very pervasive in education. Um, and I also touch on how this has trickled into our communities and uh, there is a degree of separation amongst people within community as well. There is there are high levels of conflict, um, and I partially explain this idea of lateral violence and the and the deep defenses, emotional defenses, or what we might call protective instincts. I think uh, that are really intended to keep us safe. Uh, but actually interfere and get in the way of what we really need, which is intimate emotional and psychological connection with people um, within community. And uh, then I go on to talk a little bit about my experience as a contemplative educator um, and, and sort of my own coming to know journey using my own lived experience as a site of scholarly inquiry, my own losses, my own traumas, um, how these experiences have led to a developed awareness and consciousness for me that really, uh, I think, helps me as an educator to do that thing we were just talking about, which is to just show up transparently as I am and how important and how needed this is. And then I go on to talk about the, the uh, project at SFU where we worked uh, with some beautiful Squamish knowledge carriers here on our lands with a group of grad students and faculty from SFU. Um, and I think it was a beautiful process that really invited and gave people a lived experience of becoming the imperfect friend. And how, how, um, how indigenous, but for me specifically Squamish ways of knowing and being invite a relational process in which learning is anything but perfect. There's struggle, it's emotional, there are tears, there are frustrations. Um, there's no one there giving you a template saying, this is what your product should look like. This is what you're aiming for. Um, it's a very uh, 
contextualized, individualized path, pedagogical path for coming to know. And it's a really beautiful path for coming to know in which relationship provides this wonderful container for learning in a completely different way. Um, and so maybe now is a good time to share the, I don't know, if it feels like a good time to share the film, we can we can shift to that. And um, yeah, please, I encourage you to take a look at the article if you hadn't, haven't had a chance. Um, I've had a lot of good feedback on it and I go into more depth in, around all these areas I just covered. So yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll hop in to the film now. I was 32 by the time I got into the canoe. My mom was residential school, so I wasn't taught all of this culture because it was taken away from her. And then I ended up doing a bit of um, residential school as well. So ever since I got in that canoe in 90, found out that what I'm here in life for is to take care of canoes, to, to show people, you know, part of our culture. I'm not much on that reconciliation stuff, but you know, for people to come here and want to take part in this, this is what that word means to me. I don't know if we're started now or... I feel like, I don't know if, if moving together is a new skill as much as it's a found or a rediscovered sort of a human instinct that we all have. And I, and I think that, you know, the colonial project and institu institutions that are a product of colonialism um, have just eclipse our human instinct to take care of each other and and to be together and so i think it's about you know revitalizing that memory here and maybe like what is the institution it's just made up of human beings being human um so revitalizing that collective memory for for what makes us human really um I think that that might be new. And I think that we all need someone to remind us over and over because there's so much pressure. You can't heal and develop and grow and learn outside of the context of relationship. We need people to come together to take up a relationship with the land and learn how to walk and, and live in this land in a good way. And I think that culture and ceremony has the potential to transform us and to heal us. And it's something that you have to experience and you can't just talk about. I feel a huge sense of like pride that we have these indigenous ways of moving, of living, of understanding, of relating, um, that are good medicine for everybody. I was asked to work on this project that was uh, meant to be for TAs around decolonizing the classroom. We wanted our grad students to have a chance to do something and learn something in a totally uh, unusual way, a way that they don't normally learn things um, to grad school and they don't normally teach things in their tutorials. I think our hope for this project um, and for these students is that they have an experience that I think fundamentally moves their heart a little bit in terms of the why of 
doing decolonizing work. I was introduced to Denise and Lee, uh, and we met and talked a little bit about how we could design a program to support decolonizing teaching and learning for graduate students. And she said, you know, to do this right, we have to go to um, folks who are part of the community and ask them about what they think that we should do. We shouldn't say what that is um, in advance. Ask them, what do you think? Like, we want to do some sort of a decolonial program. Where should we start? Thinking about decolonization in an institution, an academic institution like Simon Fraser University, where there's pretty sedimented ways of thinking about education and doing things that in this project, leading with relationship meant we had to slow down. We had to slow down. We had to create places and spaces where we could be in relationship with each other. We, we had to make room for a diversity of ideas um, and different ways of thinking. One of the things that I said really early on in the process was I wanted people to feel cared for. I wanted us to look after our relationships in that process and that that would be the most important thing for me um, and my continued involvement. And so the process was going to be different in that we weren't going to start with the development of learning outcomes and sort of setting our goals and then trying to figure out how will we meet those goals and those learning outcomes we very quickly uh, realized that this was all about relationship and Indigenous ontologies and epistemologies that are innately relational. Through that good relating, the program started to emerge and take shape. And it evolved into this beautiful program called Moving Together in the Ways of the People that uh, included grad students and faculty. And it's been, it's just been so amazing. Ceremony is, you know, I think uh, Vicki Kelly said it really well. It's the pedagogy of all the work that we're doing, you know, because it moves people in ways that they would never expect to be moved. It, it begins to connect that beautiful brain of theirs to their heart, and it becomes heart work instead of head work. <laughs> I had to have, I had to put that in. <laughs> when you are doing that work and you, you see how people turn, well, they're, they're leaving the human world and entering into the spirit world. We do the cedar brushing for people that might feel a little bit out of sorts or unease or uh, may have some illness to cleanse us from any anything that is really unseen to the eye. I'm st I still learn as old as I am. I'm st I still continue to learn something new yeah. in every ceremony. It has been really different from any kind of program that I've participated in previously because through carving, I need to be really focused on what I'm doing right now, right here. It makes me be present. I've been appreciating that aspect of it. We're looking at anti-colonial pedagogies and different ways of knowing and being and learning. What this program is really doing is deconstructing what has been, for me, the traditional classroom experience. We haven't even been in a classroom yet. So we have the... One is not good. We have an old ship line. <laughs> you stay on either side of that line. To your center, you eyeball it. And you just snap it. You just flip it over and do the same thing. So you got that, and that's another one of those OS lines. So you don't carve past that, those two lines. Just gives you that much more room to shape it. It shows uh, 
the different approach to education, like the Western type of education, mostly learning for a certificate, diploma, or degree, but does it really give you anything apart from like few pieces of knowledge? Because this, what I've been doing here, actually gave me many things. Now I'm, <laughs> I don't even care if I like have my battle finished because the process here is more important than the final outcome. While in Western education, the result is like the outcome is important and like you, you reach this outcome in whichever way you can and not necessarily remember the middle part or just <laughs> get your certificate and go, I guess. My hope in sort of finishing this up and, and moving forward is that I will feel more confident in my own understanding of what reconciliation can look like. When instructors have an opportunity to connect to who they are and that that Squamish value of being human, and they really understand that on a fundamental level, um, which we hope is kind of one of the things that has happened through this program, then they're able to take that sort of wholeness as their instructor selves, that lens and that way of looking at the world, of, of, of seeing where we are here um, on this territory, in this place, and they bring that to their classroom practice. They bring that to everything they do. They bring, you can't lose that lens once you've kind of understood it, once you've felt it, once that's, that change has happened. Um, then, then you're going to bring that to everything you do. You'll, you'll, you'll think about your students maybe in a slightly different way. You'll think about what materials you're choosing in a slightly different way. You'll think about the, how you want your classes to be and feel, where you take them, who you invite knowledge is valued. I think it goes beyond SFU. I hope to continue learning. I take the, you know, being welcomed by the Squamish community very seriously. And and I want to honor these practices because, you know, as I mentioned, these are the practices that we need. Um, and I really believe that it, we, we're, are, we are really going to decolonize our institutions or our society. It really begins with our own individual practice. Retrospectively, looking back at how this whole journey has gone regarding moving together in the ways of the people, there have been so many profoundly pedagogical moments that are beyond measure. And I actually question if it would even be ethical to try and measure any of that. Um, but I feel something really big is happening here that is beyond me, that's beyond the institution. I feel like people are hungry for this um, and that there's a huge amount of potential for like just a heart to be restored to academia in this way. And that this is, I mean, is this not what we're all trying to figure out as we deal with intensifying global crises that, you know, the, the you know, institutions that have focused only on intellect and cognition are not, we're not, we're not meeting those challenges adequately. So this is about developing the spirit of people, the heart of people. And I feel like indigenous worldviews and philosophies generally, and for me, my Squamish teachings are such medicine for people. What I'm coming to understand is that at the root of my culture and also many indigenous, if not all indigenous cultures, uh, is this intention um, to preserve, maintain, and strengthen relationships always, because our survival depends on it. And so what are we gonna do next? How will we move together going forward uh, is, a, is a great question. Um, 
I think the answer to that is that we will go back to community and our advisory group and ask them where they see what might be the next thing that we can do that would be in keeping with Skohomish values, that would be in keeping with the seasons, that would be in keeping with what uh, the elders and knowledge keepers are um, recommending for us, what we need to learn more about. We would really like for this initial cohort um, to act as mentors or guides or definitely be involved in whatever happens next. We want to have an opportunity to invite more faculty to take part in this kind of program and moving together to move teaching practices in, in a new um, and really expansive way. We're going to need everybody on the journey of reconciliation. We're called to this action. I quote Elder uh, Jackie Gonzalez and the late Tanoth and what they taught me, which was when spirit moves, it moves. When spirit wants something, it happens very quickly and obstacles are moved out of the way. And Everybody wants to do what's next. We need to figure out what that is together. We need to listen carefully um, and, and, and then move. We need to move. So yeah, I think now is a, is a brilliant moment for what's going to happen next. And we have some great ideas. Uh, our elders have some wonderful ideas about what they'd like to see happen at the university with instructors and um, we're really excited to keep moving and um, to explore and find out where we go next from here. Yeah. It was such a great film. I enjoyed it a lot. I liked how it kind of talked about um, moving and how that um, the the paddling and like the carving and the different teachings with that. Um, I just was wondering, like, how did you choose the name "Moving Together in the Ways of the People"? Um, what kind of sparked that for you to make the name for that? Well, I have to just say that I. Every time I watch that, and it doesn't matter how many times I get a smile plastered on my face because I just, it's seeing everybody and just being able to revisit and, and uh, just the beautiful memories and the feeling of being in that really sacred space and time with those folks. It's, it's just, a, it was really uh, precious and um it's just made this massive imprint on my heart and brain that will be there forever. Uh, but yeah, the, the name, it was interesting because we had an advisory circle um, and we had started planning and preparing. And then uh, on one of the days we, we gathered and we started to talk about, well, what will we call this? And we spent quite a lot of time throwing words out, like sort of a brainstorming session. And there was all kinds of different possibilities up on a whiteboard um and then it sort of happened like we we were looking at all these words we'd thrown up there and then it, it was just an interesting sort of like we all sort of were like oh well what about this word and what about this word and, and this phrase uh, got written down moving together in the ways of the people and we sort of all were like ah oh, that's it uh, because this idea of moving is so important uh, it, because it speaks to that idea of flux 
nothing being fixed, nothing becoming static, but this idea of being alive and moving and in motion. Um, I also feel like it touches on a really important aspect of what we were doing there, which is touching the heart and moving the emotions. As you saw, tear, people had tears. It, it was very emotional. Their hearts were engaged. I think that's so important. I, I think that we've we've been educating from the neck up for far too long, and we need to we need to start to um, practice a pedagogy that that touches and moves the heart, that engages the heart, that engages the spirit, and spirit moves. I, I said that in the video. You know, one of the things that my elders have taught me is that when spirit moves, it moves, and um, you feel that movement. Um, and together uh, spoke to how foundational relationship, how essential relationship is, and not just being together, but actively engaging in creating safe relational spaces where we can be imperfect and vulnerable with each other where we where we can see each other mm -hmm. where i can i can let myself i'm safe to let myself be seen and other people are safe to let themselves be seen and we are seeing each other in a way that maybe doesn't commonly very ha happen, or maybe people have never, some people have never had an experience of fully being seen. Um, so that was a really important aspect of it. Um, and then of course, in the ways of the people, and that meant that our knowledge carriers being on the land, getting it out of the institution of SFU, being on Squamish territory and lands, and being taught and led by Squamish Nation elders and knowledge carriers was so uh, central to the whole program. And what I really loved about that was um, watching our beautiful uh, people come alive to respond to this call, to provide something and to care for people. And mm -hmm. the dignity of that and to see, wow, like you have people with lifetimes of experiences that in their own rights deserve a PhD because of all that they've, they've learned about culture uh, and tradition and to give them an opportunity, not, not as a side thing to a dominant program, but as central leaders of that program is mm -hmm. so beautiful. So the name sort of captures all of all of that. And I think names are so important. Mm -hmm. How we name things are so important. So it's yeah, it's the best we could do without using Squamish language, right? Like it's it's it captures the essence of the whole program. Definitely. Yeah, I, I really I, I love the name. Like I think um, you spoke to so many different points that popped up in my mind about how it's um, it's the way we move our body, it's the way the world moves, and how we move through um, different things. And I think I think you really encapsulated that with that name, and I really enjoyed uh, hearing you describe that. Um, we have a few questions here that uh, I'll just hop into. Um, So you kind of talked about this, um, this relationship building. Um, someone was just wondering, like relationship building is imperative to creating trust. Can you share some success stories that re resonate with you? Um, I think, I think at this point in my career, it's taken me a long time to learn how to do that, especially with groups in a mm -hmm. classroom setting. I mean, I, I taught a a class last year. It was a bridging program at SFU, and I had indi all Indigenous students uh, who had been in care at one point or another in their life had it been impacted by intergenerational trauma, um, and some displaced um, and you know not having connection to their biological families or communities or cultures and. Um, being asked to deliver a curriculum to the students and, and meeting the students um, for the first time and realizing, oh, I can't, can't even, like for me to just go into the curriculum and to the learning outcomes with these, I'll lose every single one of them. None of them will last. And, and recognizing I needed to slow down, I, I needed to um, model my own humility um, and my humanness 
and to invite them into a safe relational space um, where they felt seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I read the need for that uh, really early on, and that's only because of my years of experiences of working in all these different communities and failing miserable in my, miserably at many times in my younger years, tripping all over people um, and doing and saying the wrong things that, that I could very quickly do a temperature check and go, yeah, I, I have to, regardless of what I've been asked to do and what my job responsibilities as an instructor are, I have to pause that in order to establish a working relationship with these with these young people. And because of that, what something really brilliant happened. And and that was that they um the, for the most part, most of them made it through my class and they did the writing assignment that they needed to do and they were terrified to write. Uh, and um in, in some of their other classes they were doing no writing right up until the end. But I feel like I gave these young people a sense of hope. I, I allowed them, I shared my own story. I revealed myself to them. Um, and I did that so that they could see that they too could do, that there's a place there for them as well, that what they've gone through in their lives matters and means something. Uh, and so, you know, that was an example of, of where creating that safety, you know, mm -hmm was essential. We would have been dead in the water. I mean, moving together in the ways of the people, it was another, in the beginning, people were like, well, what about, where's the, where's the uh, syllabus? Where's this? Where, what are we going to be doing? Like, you can just, all the questions that come up when people are feeling, you know, that sense of precarity, that ambiguity, oh, like, oh, I, do, I don't quite feel comfortable here. I, I don't know what to expect. I don't know how to perform or behave here. I don't know what is wanted of me. And I think there's something really magical when you can invite people into a space where there aren't expectations and they're free to be themselves and you can convey enough safety for them to be able to do that. Because then what happens is the group becomes the curriculum. It's like a living pedagogy. What they bring, who they are, uh, becomes yeah, it becomes the material. So, I mean, there's a, so many different examples, whether I'm working with one person and I'm not perfect. I mess up. I have my stressful days. I, I still trip over people occasionally and trip over my own self if my emotions are running high, but I know at the end of the day, if it matters to me, uh, and, uh, I want, uh, I, I want to be able to offer anything to anyone that they have to feel a sense of emotional and psychological safety with me. And how I do that is by being imperfect and revealing myself to people. Yeah. I like that. I, I, it's so great hearing from you. Like, it's great just how real you are, you know, like, it's not like this performance, like you uh, have been saying, like, it's, it's your authentic self and, I think that's that's what we need with um, our teachers and educators, or just people in general. Like, I think we need more more authenticity and whatnot. Like I think it's it's much needed, and um, this kind of like goes into one of our next questions. So you use the term um, I can I'm gonna do my best with saying it contemplative <laughs> often in your scholarly and everyday work. Can you tell us a bit more about this? You kind of touched on it at the beginning, but could you get, give us a bit more? um inside on well i mean contemplative education i guess could be defined as sort of the multiplicity of ways in which we can come to know things but contemplative education includes the wisdom traditions that exist in many many different cultures and and indigenous um indigenous wisdom tradition and Squamish wisdom tradition i never like to put our our wisdom under an umbrella like contemplative, but that really is contemplative education. What it does is it says, okay, like, like for instance, we have a lot of mindfulness in the school system right now. You hear that, right? Mindfulness. And people think, oh, that that's contemplative practice. That's contemplative education. It actually isn't. The mindfulness movement in schools doesn't actually acknowledge the, the, the roots of mindfulness, which is Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of Buddhism is about raising one's consciousness level. 
and awareness level. Mindfulness in schools is being used as a classroom strategy and a behavioral strategy. And so we, you know, those are the kinds of discussions that we have. And, and that's, you know, so, so for me, I look at, okay, if we do Squamish um, pedagogy and, and we do, we bring in these teachings, it can never, ever become divorced from the people, from the land. It can never be taken outside of that context and instrumentalized by people who are not Skohomish, like appropriated the way things are. And Buddhism has really been appropriated in a lot of ways under the guise of mindfulness. And it's been divorced from the roots of a tradition that is thousands of years old. And in, in losing those roots, we lose the meaning. And I think that that's what can happen in reconciliation in some cases as well, is that it becomes sort of a performance. Mm -hmm. And we miss the deep and rich philosophical roots and meanings that honestly, for me, I know so little. I mean, I have teachings, but I know so little um, and I'm learning, but I mean, there's so much more for me to learn. And, and if I, if I just take that little one little piece out of context and I start to apply it like a strategy, oh my goodness, it, it's, uh, it's unethical. It's unethical. Mm -hmm. So I hope, I mean, that's, that's really when we're talking about contemplative education, it's like, oh, wow. Like there are these beautiful, beautiful wisdom traditions that we can tap into that teach us how, um, to walk on the planet in a really good way that can help us be better relatives to the planet, to each other, that can help us to act more ecologically, more ethically, and more relationally. But those teachings are not just for us to take one little piece and use it in any which way we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's listening to the whole story or seeing the whole landscape, right? Like it's not just pinpointing it and um yeah I, I i definitely hear what you're saying when you explain that um someone wanted to know um how do you create safe relational spaces in an institutional setting um and being on the land water is a beautiful classroom what but we aren't often gifted that um like how would you do that uh create a more a safe relational space in kind of like a classroom setting well, you know, I did it with the with a group of students that um, I was just talking about in the Indigenous students in the in the Indigenous bridging program. Um, and what that meant is I had to resist. I mean, and this is where I think inner development comes in. And, and I think we underestimate we've forgotten how important um, development of the inner self is in, in terms of our own um, consciousness level, our own awareness of ourselves in these physical bodies walking, you know, walking on the earth, um, that we teach who we are, right? That's what Parker Palmer says, we teach who we are. Uh, we also teach who we're not. And so if we're, we're teaching, uh, if we're saying one thing, but we're practicing another, we're really teaching what we do, not what we say. Mm -hmm. And so I think in institutions of higher education, educators need the opportunity and need to be encouraged to do the inner work um, mm -hmm. to develop themselves. And I think, I mean, making a drum, carving a paddle with the right mentorship, oh my goodness, you learn so much about yourself. Mm -hmm. You learn so much about yourself in relationship to the cedar, in relationship to the hide. Uh, those are teachers for us, but it's that it's that congruency. It, you know, as my grandmother used to say, uh, "Say what you mean and mean what you say." Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's a it's congruency that makes people feel safe. Um, and a prioritizing of relationship. If I if I walk in and I say relationship matters, and I'm I'm invested in having every single person feel welcome to show up exactly as who they are, then I actually have to be modeling that, and I have to be showing up as I am, mm -hmm. and inviting that. And so there's not a, a, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question because I for me to show up in fully Denise is a different 
process or methodology than it is for Serene to show up as fully Serene. And so, you know, my hope for every everyone is that for stu for teachers and students and, and everybody is that their inner work has to do with showing up fully who they are. And I'll tell you, it's tricky. It's tricky. And I remember um, distinctly a moment uh, in my path during my master's um, education journey. And I said something in the group and I was quite adamant and I was almost slightly aggressive. And I, like, I, I had a point to make and I was digging my heels in and it was a bit of a polarizing comment. And I had enough awareness that this other voice came in and, and the voice sort of whispered, do you even believe what you're saying right now? Like whose voice is that? And I actually examined, is it a societal voice that's been put upon me? Is it my, is it a voice from my first family? Is that my voice? And I came to the conclusion that it wasn't. And then I started to get curious about for how many years I'd been speaking things that weren't even true to who I am as a person, but somebody else's beliefs that they put upon me. So part of it is like liberating ourselves from those things and shedding, shedding those, um, those layers mm -hmm. and contemplative practices can help us in that way. It helps develop an awareness of ourselves in space and time. So there's always this little part of us. And I actually think um, that our ancestors had very high levels of consciousness because everything I hear about Squamish elders is that everything's done very intentionally. And in order to be intentional, we need to be awake we need to know what we're choosing to do and why we're choosing to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that kind of answers the, another question. Someone was kind of asking how you do this with online classes, but I feel like you answered that um, in your answer for the last question. So I, I think, um, I think it's so true. Like, I think it's being more intentional. I feel like sometimes people kind of um, want to be intentional, but they're not like, uh, I think it's like a, it's going back to that mindfulness and like knowing what and self-reflecting like like you said you did with um your own self with um your own point about how um you were going to say something but then you reflected on how does the drive re resonate with this um comment or this answer like and um really engaging in that and I feel like a lot of our, our people would do that out on the land like I know with my people we would um especially during like the puberty time would would fast for four days and um a lot of people would be like oh your vision quest right and I'm like ah oh, I, I like it's not really like a vision quest I think it's like more of like engaging in self-reflection and seeing like what you want to see in your life um and what and how you want to act and want to be right like it's um taking those land teachings but also like taking the teachings that you've had from your own experience or your own teachers and whatnot and um, learning how to navigate that and how it um, sits well with you and whatnot. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful example because you think about being out on the land and fasting for that many days. There, there, there's so many moments where your inner conflicts with yourself are arising and you're you're in relation, you're in deep relationship with your own self and in dialogue with your own self during those times. And you're getting to know aspects of yourself that maybe have been hidden um, from you. Like our shadow aspects come up mm -hmm. during times like that. So these are profound um, ways of developing our spiritual selves and that kind of that level of awareness that I would say, maybe we call it a kind of a wisdom or an embodied sort of way of knowing and being. Uh, I feel like we have been so focused in education and in the world on external measurable results and controlling everything outside of ourselves that we've forgotten that we have these long standing traditions for developing ourselves as human beings so that we can be good relatives and that we can walk on the earth in a good way with each other. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We have another question. Um, it's kind of, um, I think it's talking a bit more of like decolonizing and uh, indigenizing um, and creating a safer space for institutions. So I'll just ask it now. 
How do you work with institutional hierarchies at universities to support this type of education and change of heart? Um, top Indigenous leaders in my institution have been leaving over the past year, possibly due to the bad decisions by the president and executive at our university. How would you rebuild within a massive institution and how would we work in a colonial political structures and hierarchies? Yeah, it, well, I'm going to say it's not easy. And I know a lot of people are burnt out and they are leaving because they're working so tirelessly. Um, I feel like there, it's like a, I think both are needed. I feel like a top down and a bottom up approach is needed. Uh, I, I think we need to be working with students, faculty, administrators, but then we also need to be working with leaders. And I actually think that the work that needs to happen is not, um, we need to disrupt the status quo in terms of, of the reconciliation often gets taken up in the institution within the dominant paradigm. So it, it we do it, but what insidiously happens is that it just sort of gets taken up within the existing frames. And then it sort of just almost um, becomes invisible or gets eclipsed or, or it just disintegrates somehow. So it doesn't affect the kind of changes that we are hoping to see. But I feel like getting where possible, getting people out of the institution onto the land, but also processes and pra praxis, which praxis is, this is how we change things, change our praxis, change our process and change the outcome. And I think instead of talking about intellectualizing and cognitively approaching, um, how do we do reconciliation? That is, that is still continuing to operate in that dominant way in within the Western institution that is familiar to the institution, that is comfortable. It doesn't take people out of the head into the heart. People have to have an emotional experience and for them to have an emotional experience, they need to be disarmed, mm -hmm. disarmored. Uh, and that is not easy to do if we are um, continuing to do the work within the places and spaces, institutional places and spaces where cognition is the sort of favored dominant way of doing it. We have to have a praxis for touching the heart. And again, this is where we as educators or facilitators, who we are as individuals, we have to have a developed heart mind condition connection to be able to do that work. We can't talk about doing transformational heart work. I think there's a profound grieving um, process that has to unfold that many people are avoiding. I think if, if um, for, for many people, if their defenses and their armor were to come down long enough and it was to sink in the travesty, uh, you know, of, of some of the historical things that have gone on, some of the injustices that are still continuing on and the general overall state of our society, there would be a deep, deep and profound grieving process that would unfold. And I actually think that that's necessary. Um, but we have to do baby steps. Like, I, you know, we can't, you can't say to administrators, Oh, we're gonna we're gonna do a grieving process, right? Like most administrators, I think would would rather just go for the low hanging fruit and that more performative those performative acts of reconciliation that look really good. I'm not saying that those aren't needed and aren't important. I think they are. I think they build awareness. I think they're steps in the right direction. But the real work um, there for transformation to happen. As Bio Akamalafe would say, and he's a Nigerian philosopher, he says, our knees kind of have to hit the ground. And he says, nothing new can start until something else finishes, and nothing can be finished until we grieve it. Mm -hmm. And has there been the grieving? I don't think so, because I think academic institutions are really hard at, really good at keeping them heart and the mind divided and separate. Mm hmm yeah, we have a comment um, uh, from the chat. It's um, The comment is, you're asking yourself if you believe what you're saying, thinking, where does this belief come from? And if it's actually the authentic 
uh, you is mind blowing. Self awareness is missing in our society, which focus on production and outputs in the fast paced time we are living in, touching the heart for the connection and to be open to others' experiences and realities is so true. Like, yeah, I think I think you're right. Like, I feel like a lot of us are lacking that that connection to our heart and connection to who who our true self is. And um, and I think we're just doing a lot of performative. Um, and I, we see this in the university with um, different connections to attempts to reconciliation. And I think it's moving past that performative and kind of diving deeper. And like you said, that grieving process, but also um, that connection to one's heart and whatnot. And yeah, I think um, There's, I just want to say there aren't easy answers. There aren't, and I don't have the answer. I only have my experiences to draw on. Um, and what I know comes from my lived experiences. But I do, I do strongly believe that policy change in our institutions, they're made by people. Mm -hmm. Those policies are created by people and they're changed by people. And unless we can touch the hearts of those people and those people can have a transformative experience where they can see something that they couldn't previously see and they could feel something that they couldn't previously feel, then those they're not going to change those things very easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. Like, I think it's, we're wanting to do transformational work, but we have to, to connect with with ourselves right like and um it's it can be challenging for some people because they've never probably ever had um that feeling of connecting to oneself or connecting to one's heart and um or engaging in the grief of um of whatnot and um, that kind of leads to one of our questions is like how do you support people who open up and about grief and and grief like like well, they're at that step, but they don't know. How, like, how do you support one with that? Well, for me, grief is best taken care of in an indirect manner. I, I actually find talking about it can take us out of it. And that's where having processes and, and um, experiences. And, and I think this is where culture can be so, uh, such a beautiful process for feeling or regaining or recovering our capacity to feel our sadness, um, our disappointment, our even shame sometimes about, about how we may have contributed even inadvertently um, to something that could have been harmful or may, maybe was harmful. Um, that emotions, the, the, real, the real powerful emotions that have the capacity to change our brain structures, our pre-linguistic and pre-cognitive. So often there are no words. And so it's a very gentle holding, inviting. I think people need, again, this is where my own inner work um, uh, around taking up a relationship with my own emotional states and being comfortable with the emotional states of others. Not be, we live in a society, people are afraid of emotion. Parents are afraid of emotion in their young ones even, and we shut it down. We go to shut it down so quickly because we, because we haven't been practicing it. We've, we've been all in our logic and our head. So for me, it, there's nothing to do with it. It's, it's about giving a safe invitation, conveying, um, that all emotions are welcome. And then when they surface, just this really steady, gentle holding of people in that space without trying to take them out of it too quickly um, or, or jumping into fix or talk about it or intellectualize it, but just allowing and normalizing it and being being a steady sort of advocate for feelings and for tears and and a representative of that if you will where it's like ah oh, we celebrate like I tell people I celebrate that process that's mm -hmm. an important process we all need and I think anyone that that if you think about I just wrote a little bit about this but if you think about some of our uh, chief 
uh, Bobby Joseph, if you think about someone like Viktor Frankl or Nelson Mandela, people who've lived through atrocities mm -hmm. and they've gone on to transcend those atrocities, they um, have maintained their ability to feel their deepest emotions. They all of them talk about love. Um, well, you can't talk about love and no love unless unless you've you know, you can also touch your pain. So it's, yeah, the, these are, these are, these, this wisdom's also there within, within all of our uh, traditional knowledge systems about emotion and tears and grieving. And yeah. Definitely. We have time for just one last question. Um, I think, um, sorry, I'm just trying to, Well, maybe we'll end with this one. Um, how do we become transformational facilitators? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that uh, right here or or um, if I have a, a method, uh, but I think a lot of the things I've talked about have to do with drawing on one's own lived experiences. Um, and one of the things here's here's what I can say about this that's helped me along the way. In my early days as a facilitator, traveling around BC and Canada, working in Indigenous communities, and often going in in my younger years, overconfident and being taken down a notch because the kinds of things that would come up in in group processes that would just like take me back like maybe maybe someone would come with really big attacking energy. They were frustrated or they didn't like what I had said um that one of the things i would do is i would go away and i would do my inner work around those pieces i i would go and do my inner work around what caught me and why and i would try to embody the other person's state of being and emotional experience to try and understand and own how my lack of consciousness landed on another person and may have provoked them uh, so it's again working working with ourselves and and working with others so it's not actually just working with this oneself but working with others and their emotional states and and developing our um, capacity to be with the full range of human expression and emotion um, and to not get caught so we descend into our own personal sort of narratives around things and personalize things and, and um, lose our power in that really. Mm -hmm. And that's one way I've done that over the years, but there's many, 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 many things, many things, many ways that we can develop our ability to work with people more effectively, more care, more ethically, more ecologically, more relationally. Yes. We had one last question that we probably could just slide in. Um, it's just wondering, someone was wondering, will you be doing more speaking and sharing events in the near future outside of the classroom? Well, I think I will be, but first I just need to finish writing my dissertation and I'm in the thick of that. So wish me well uh, on getting that done. Uh, so I'm sure once that's done, I'll be more available, but um, yes. I, I, and I, and I do get asked to speak here and there, and I'm still doing different things. I don't have anything in the near, near future. Um, but if you check out my website, then we, you can, uh, maybe we'll start to post things on there. Someone asked for the name. I saw that one pop up. Someone asked for a name of, oh, Bio Akomalafe. B-A-Y-O A. K O M A L back bio map. Oh, geez. I, I have to look Google. I have to Google it. I never can remember it. So it's so long. Ah, there. I'll type, put it in the. But I'm so glad I had this chance. I haven't been to learning circles in so long because I've been doing my PhD studies and 
so consumed with that. And so I forgot how lovely it is to just be here and sit in conversation and to hear from folks and thank you, Serene. It's been so nice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you have any closing words that you want to share with the group? And then we'll hop into the closing remarks. Um, no, I just want to thank everybody. And I encourage you to, to, um, just explore uh, different ways of developing that awareness. And if they can be ways that are rooted in your own um, unique traditions and ways of knowing and being, then I think that that's, that's even more powerful. Um, and yeah, I think someone else asked for a, I, I, maybe we can send them my other article because someone asked, I think for an article on parenting or healing. And I did, I did an article called, uh, gathering our medicine that was published a while back so I'll send that out maybe you can send that to folks yeah we'll add that to the the page and um we'll have that um included in the the resource list when we email out everything um but I just want to say thank you so much um to all our guests and to everyone for joining us today it was so great to hear and have an amazing discussion with you Denise it was great to learn about um uh, how to be an imperfect friend and how to show up for oneself and emotions and um, and just li like have that heart connection to um, to yourself and like um, just sharing the film and everything like I feel like I learned so much and just having the conversation with you I feel like was very grounding for me and like uh, just made me feel very um, enlightened and, uh, and I'm really really glad that we got to have this conversation um, but just before we end the webinar, I'd love to bring your attention to our upcoming uh, learning circles. We have um, sharing Anishinaabe health research in um, good ways with Cindy, Pe Cindy Peltier. Uh, it's on November 16th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, please sign up for our uh, newsletter um, on our website at www.learningcircle.ubc.ca. And um, if you want to um, check out our website, um, feel free to do that. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. We look forward to seeing everyone and seeing you at our next learning circle. Lim Limp, thank you.